Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Fahana Yamin. She's an environmental lawyer and has also been a negotiator on behalf of the small island states in the UN process that led to the Paris Agreements. She has also been a leading figure in Extinction Rebellion. Famously, she was arrested for gluing herself to the Shell headquarters in London in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Fahana Yamin to Cleaning Up. So Fahana, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, there's a lot to clean up, Michael. <laughs> there is a monumental cleanup, a Herculean, you could almost say, an Augean stable's worth of cleaning up. But, uh, but what we're talking about on these shows um, is really about leadership. It's not just the cleanup. It's not, the, it's not a technocrat's show about how many you know, gigawatts and megawatts we have to clean up. It's really about the choices that people uh, have made to play a role in this kind of, uh, in, in the age of climate change. And you've just got one of the most interesting sort of career paths. I'm not sure if you call it a career path, but a personal path. Um, you started um, by studying law. I mean, you started before then, but I mean, we'll start by you as a, you were a student and then you became a, 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 a lawyer and got involved in the climate negotiations. Can we start there and, and you explain sort of what was your, why did, why did you take those particular choices at that time? Yeah, so I, I was at uni in 1983 to 1986. And actually, I, did, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was, um, you know, I did politics, philosophy and economics, which allows you to do run, run the world and run the empire. That's what this course was set up uh, hundreds of years to, to do. Um, I came out and I, my first job, age 21, was the Central Electricity Generating Board. So I went straight into the power sector in a high-flying management scheme that was set up for graduates. Um, and the CGB, the Central Electricity Generating Board for the older people who are here, owned every single power station in, the, in, in, in England and Wales, including all the nuclear ones, including the coal ones, the gas ones. Um, and include the including the grid, the, what's the national grid. And when I came in, it was the time when Mrs. Thatcher came in as well and was privatizing many nationalized industries. So I'd chosen as a sort of good progressive left-wingy kind of person actually to join a nationalized industry because that's what we used to do at that time if you wanted to, to th there were certain things that you know us lot did. You joined the BBC or joined, so I did that. Um, and 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 within within weeks of my joining, the privatization of British coal was happening. Um, you know, I, I'd left university on the back of the coal industry being decimated in this country. Very very politically divisive era, actually. Um, and I joined, as I said, the electricity generating board. And my uh, first introduction me, and love of this sector comes from that, actually. So, so I just Fahan, I just want to interject because there's some incredible kind of coincidence here, which is that the person on cleaning up just before you, one week before this will air, um, is John Pettigrew, who's the CEO of National Grid. So <laughs> you probably started at CEGB. I don't know exactly when he started and where he started, but um, so the, hopefully our audience will sort of put two and two together and understand the sort of environment that you would have come into and what the issues as they are today that you were, would have been grappling with yeah and so so the the two big issues I was grappling with well there was privatization was going on and that was a political fact but environmentally we were grappling with uh, the fallout from the Chernobyl uh, disaster uh, and then the, a, a huge reaction against nuclear power including in this country including the safety of our old reactors and whether a new wave of PWRs, you know, size we'll see, Hinkley, those would go ahead. We just had the biggest public inquiry at that time in history about whether we should go for a further and different design of nuclear. And the other one, which was much more um, uh, uh, potent across Europe as well, was 
you know, acid rain, what was, you know, wonderfully termed and was acid rain, you know, the whole of the German forest, the Northern European forests, you know, large parts of England and Wales too, were being affected by sulfur emissions and other noxious gases emitted mainly by our power sector. So these, these were the kinds of big issues that I was sort of grappling with, uh, as well as, as well as sort of, you know, coming in at a time when um, the answer uh, supposedly to all of the problems, pollution, you know, prices, uh, energy stability was markets and private markets at that. You know, it was very much I came in at a time when the, the narrative was that the state is a failure, state planning is a failure, state enterprises are a failure. And the, the way to get better anything uh, was to privatize it all. So that's that's the sort of um, background that I had. And I, and I still think that my interest in climate change and air pollution essentially, you know, uh, came from an understanding of, of the energy, the energy world at that time, because that's what I'd done. Um, I left the Central Electricity Generating Board, though, after about a year and a bit, because I decided um, I didn't want to just be a senior manager. I wanted to have a more defined, specific role. And I liked the, the legal role there that, you know, the lawyers you know, provided a very specific and tangible set of expertise. So I went off to do um, uh, law school and initially I'd wanted to work very much in a different kind of way in a community law center and, you know, in a, in a more um, uh, grounded way. But uh, I ended up uh, after, um, as, uh, when I qualified working in the, a law firm called Bates, Wells and Braithwaite, which still exists, which um, advised lots of charities and one of the charities that they were advising was a brand new charity that started advising on environmental law, especially international environmental law. And one of their first funded projects was to advise on the negotiations that were then being set up, which became the 1992 Climate Change Treaty. So that's my um, entry. So I, I feel like sometimes people think, oh, everyone's careers is sort of all, all set out. And actually mine was a series of, accidents and opportunities and luck and then things that I found exciting and interesting. So for me, the climate change negotiations, given my background, um, both in law and energy, you know, really interested me at the time. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and I, I don't know about many people who have, I don't know that there are that many people who've come on cleaning up who have had a sort of programmatic career. And that's why it's so fascinating because certainly, um, you know, Steve Jobs, um, in his, I think, commencement address, he talked about, you can only join the dots looking backwards. And that's certainly been the case for me. I am here doing this, um, you know, from following, you know, studying engineering, doing some, a lot of skiing, rather too much skiing, probably some venture capital, um, some dot com stuff, information provider, you know, and then you end up where you are. So you, you, I mean, I don't want to say fell into, but you gravitated towards um, helping these island states in those negotiations is that was that the sort of yeah yeah so that yeah that, that is what happened but I guess look I did make a decision to not go into the private sector and not go where the bulk of frankly my fellow Oxford you know cohort went which was in into the city and into finance because that's where the big salaries were so I did make a conscious decision to work to be of service and essentially to have a public service career. I did apply to the civil service at one point. I didn't get that and was quite happy. So I was very happy, you know, in essentially the public sector, essentially the charitable sector. I, I, I did know that at that time, that I didn't want to be in, in the private sector, which again came from this distrust that everything was going to be solved by, by, by the private sector. So I guess... Um, there is a little bit of a trajectory there um, and it does sort of follow through because in essence my climate career ended up again trying to design carbon markets that's what happened right from the very beginning um, of these negotiations even in 1992 the convention mentions um, you know a way of jointly implementing emissions reductions basically which were that's the legal hook and the, the the terminology that was used to launch essentially offsets and tradable permits and that's what I became involved in and I gravitated towards that and my clients at the time so our work was funded by philanthropy so I understood you know instantly the importance of philanthropy actually in this setting these island countries 
could not afford the legal advice, they could not afford the economists, they could not afford the scientists. Many of them just had the two people that were, you know, the meteorologists for the entire country. Those were those were the people that came to the negotiations. It was the meteorology departments that would come and represent these. And we came along and said, no, you actually you need, you know, a, a more coordinated, uh, you know, diplomatic effort because your 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 countries are, are are at stake the future of your very existence of your countries are at stake and they understood that so they banded together and they hired um a bunch of you know english speaking british lawyers mainly um and got us funded through a private foundation through the ford foundation actually so there's many different you know parts of my career looking backwards that join up and we then provided them with legal advice and support and assistance during the negotiations and a large part of what i did in the early 90s especially in the run-up to the to the first cop in 1995 in berlin um, my biggest sort of uh, area of work was trying to get an emissions reductions based protocol uh, in and that's what we'd proposed in 1995 and that in the end turned into the Kyoto protocol negotiations and a large part of the Kyoto protocol negotiations were then designing different kinds of carbon markets so we get the clean development mechanism and we get the you know emissions trading we get joint implementation we get three different kinds of markets with the three different situations um and at the heart of all of them you know my clients the small island said we just want these markets to have integrity and to work we don't like this approach particularly but they must have environmental integrity so that's that's my sort of story for the next decade is trying to set up control design international markets and also i guess not many people know that actually i i was the head of the consortia that helped design the European emissions trading scheme, um, which again came from that work and came from my love of trying to, to marry and mix, you know, the, the best of what we could do as regulators with the unleashing of talents and approaches that the market sort of, you know, at that time, you know, it was very much like, you know, if we set the market up right, it will you know, everyone will win, 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 you know, we'll get reductions, we'll get the most efficient, we'll get a levy on them. Um, and it will, you know, that's how we will save, that's how we will save the planet. Yeah. That's great. And um, you may not have gone through in great detail the our previous guests, but there's so many different touch points, people that you know, and also some people, uh, uh, topics that touch. So, for instance, when you're talking about this mantra that privatization will solve everything, including environmental problems. And we've got Mariana Matsukata. I can't remember which episode, but, you know, but it's, in the, it's easy to find. Um, we've had uh, James Thornton, Client Earth, who took a very different view on uh, his legal background. So using environmental law to stop bad things happening rather than your approach at that time of creating markets and legal rules. And of course, we also had uh, James Cameron, who's, a, I think, a very dear uh, mutual friend of ours. And, and I'm a, I believe you worked with, he was one of those lawyers that were brought in for the small island states, was he not? And, uh, and yes, and James, James offered me, James Cameron, mm. thank you, James, offered me my first job in the environmental sector. So I went and did an internship, actually, at, was, at what became FIELD, the Foundation for International Environmental Law, and they had the largest programme then of pro bono advisory work. And... James went on to do many, many things, but he loved, um, you know, and still did work with small islands. And I worked consistently, more or less consistently for the last 30 years with, with different small islands and least developed countries. So I, sta I stayed with that. So, yeah. Now, the, the first time I met James was at an environment minister's ministerial meeting, I think convened by UNEP in Monaco in 2008. So I had started New Energy Finance in 2004, but it took me a while to sort of, uh, you know, get even slightly plugged into environment ministers and to become aware of what you had been doing effectively since 1990 or around then and uh, in the run up to the 92 Rio Earth Summit and then the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, Kyoto was only ratified in, was it 2007? Five. 2005. Yeah. Okay. So early on in new energy finance, but I was unaware of it and, and couldn't mm -hmm. kind of get my head around. It took me a few years to, you know, to stop worrying about uh, venture capital and uh, wind farms and whatever, but actually start to think about whether 
what you were doing would start to make money flow. So 2008, it was very clear that it was doing something. There was this thing called CDM, as you said, there was CDM, there was joint uh, uh, joint initiatives, and it was all, but I was still pretty skeptical because they just seemed, I mean, it, it, it was a highly legalistic, but it did seem like a sort of consultants festival of, you know, what would the base case be? You know, you kind of got money if you could prove that something that might happen was now not going to happen and everybody could sort of sign off on that. And then the printing presses of money ran. And, and I'm, I'm sort of naturally skeptical about stuff like that, if I'm honest. Yeah, well, I, I likewise, and, you know, my clients were very sceptical. So I think that by that time, though, we did have the EU emissions trading scheme was set up and running. Um, and that was a huge innovation and had fewer flaws because it was a capped system. And there was, um, I mean, the flaws of all of these ones were, in the end, there were too many permits and there wasn't enough uh, constraint that you know there was a endless supply of what we called hot air and l- two lapsed targets so they didn't really bite enough to really drive innovation to really drive reductions it was a uh, paper you know trades uh, and at the margins there were some real reductions going on this is very generalizing but across both the EU and the first phase of the EU emissions trading scheme and then subsequently the cap tightened as people realize that, you know, there'd been too many permits, you know, right. put in. And I guess, look, the lesson I learned, which again, you know, com- com- comes, you know, move w- where I am now, is industry destroyed the very instruments that they had said were the most industry-friendly, um, you know, methods of control. So we always wanted, as, as lawyers and regulators, to use, you know, um, standards or to use bans or to use phase outs and actually in industry champions and economists you know free trade economists economists said no no you don't need to use you can use permitting and you can use carbon taxes and you can use tradable permits and off those taxes didn't really take off but permits did take off and in the end in this industry and especially the private lobbies um, you know, stuffed these um, re- stuffed these um, new these initiatives with too much hot air. So they gutted the very systems that they had asked to be set up. And so that's why moving forward, you know, by the time it gets to 2008, you know, the small islands, the vulnerable countries are saying, actually, these market mechanisms are not working. Um, they may be producing lots of um, careers for you know, uh, carbon traders, um, you know, they become another financial instrument, which is great and is leading to, you know, um, um, con- as you said, consultancies and some quite high salaries in designing and operating these systems, but they're not re- resulting in real reductions. Um, and we need, you know, some reassurance that actually emissions will reduce in total and in absolute terms. So, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's by that time, we're also hearing the the scientific concerns that the two degree target, which was an informal target, was never legislated or accepted as an international target, but it was the working sort of scientific hypothesis accepted um, at that time. We were we were getting you know alarming reports that that was was very very unsafe. Uh, for vulnerable communities, for vulnerable countries, for vulnerable ecosystems. And it takes then another decade to actually get the IPCC to confirm, yes, 1.5, that little 0.5 degree difference is in fact huge in terms of the impacts and the m- hundreds of millions of people that are impacted at that degree. So, so yeah, by that time, you know, we were uh, a lot more skeptical that markets would deliver and also like this, you know, things like the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, you know, as we had then feared, and I'm saying we from the point of view of the smaller islands and the least developed countries, they had not benefited from these global market-based mechanisms. They weren't projects that were picked up from these countries. It was, as we thought, the China and India and Brazil, you know, the larger countries that dominated the, the CDM you know, the clean development mechanism markets. And the only thing that came out of it was 
a brilliant proposal that had been put in by um, uh, a, a man who subsequently died, a small island negotiator called Ambassador Ash, who'd put in this a share of the proceeds, this convoluted way of basically a little tax on carbon markets that became a way of financing adaptation, especially for vulnerable countries. So that was like the only thing we actually saw was the one positive thing, the precedent itself, as well as the actual money um, and the way that money was dispersed directly into smaller countries and organizations. But the markets themselves did not yield the expected emissions re reductions. Right. And, and just for those who are listening who are not sort of you know intimately familiar, essentially you had the EU ETS. And then that set a carbon price and the CDM, the clean development mechanism, was a way of creating credits supposedly more cheaply elsewhere and also spread some of the goodies around to developing countries and then sell them into Europe um, so that companies could meet their obligations. But as you say, the companies then just kind of, I don't want to use the word lied, but they basically overinflated the number of credits because there was a sort of grandfathering. So they could they were essentially asked how many credits would you have needed, you know, in the last few years, had the, you know, how, how much did you emit? And they just made up numbers. So they got too many credits. And then, of course, the other thing that happened was you had the financial crisis. So the growth of European industry didn't happen. There were low, there were just credits everywhere. The EU pr ETS price dropped to five or seven euros and the CDM credits became absolutely worthless. But there were also other things going on. So people had built um, C8, um, uh, chlorofluorocarbon CFC plants in China so that they could then shut them down and earn tens of millions and hundreds of millions of, of, of dollars for shutting down a plant that should never have been built in the first place. And so there were all sorts of large scale abuses. Uh, were going on at that, that time. At least that's my my sort of you know thumbnail. Because you you blame the companies. I'd actually say, well, to be honest, wasn't it just the naivete of a lot of you know environmentalists and lawyers that created this castle in the sky of 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 pseudo markets that was never going to work when it came into contact with real kind of you know yeah. um, uh, blood seeking sharks in real business. Well, I, I certainly think, look, these, these sets of tools did not come from the environmental community. They came from the economic community and they were the most popular tools from industry and industry associations, for example, in the UK, led the design of those. They seconded and had people from their law firms designing it, you know, hand in hand with the regulators. Very few... NGOs, I was one of the few that had expertise in this area, were in favour of them. And as I said, very few of our clients were, they were very sceptical. And these were not the first line of our, our chosen instruments, we had asked for reductions and mandatory reductions. And, you know, we had then also by this stage, Michael, as to fill in the audience who's listening, you know, the idea of a global carbon tax had had been dead, you know, it's still being flogged right as the way forward. So the idea of a global carbon price and a global carbon tax, the taxes that had gone forward in the US, for example, was so small. So there was absolutely no um, wow. take up. Uh, in, and that's why the EU itself then turned to using this very alien, quite American sort of way of doing things. It was quite ironic that the US had stepped back um, and it was Europe who took forward emissions tracing as as the sort of prize, you know, right. instrument that they because, had. Because of course the US so, had so, yeah, I, it's not the environmentalists. The environmentalists right. always hated these and could see the abuse and could see the gaming and you know, the environment were not responsible no. for the global recession. The finance industry was, yeah. frankly, in destroying, you know, the global economy, which then led to other problems. Um, and, the you know, markets, you know, did show me that there was this ingenuity, you know, the sale of CFC, avoided CFC reductions was incredible. And it, it, again, we had no. foreseen that, but we're not able to close those loopholes internationally. So I, I feel I was on the side of those you know, countries who were trying to close, close those loopholes in, 
you know, in a set of negotiations that they never wanted in the first place. So uh, the, the model, the model was the US had got these um, sulfur, um, um, socks and knocks, sulfur and nitrous oxides markets that had actually worked quite well. And so then that was the that was then the model to have these markets. But, you know, it was an extraordinary thing, because at the time I was meeting because I'm a sort of crossover cross dresser, because I come from finance and, uh, and investment, and I've got a Harvard MBA. And then I'm going to these you know, uh, UNEP, these environment minister conferences, and I'm starting to learn about what's going on. And I'm just, you know, just, it's just extraordinary. I mean, when you meet a banker, it's somebody from the World Bank. It was never somebody from Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. We're talking about, you know, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. You'd never meet any real financiers. <clears throat> You'd only ever meet, um, you know, multilateral financiers, you know, who have got just such a completely different incentive set from, you know, private finance, whether it's pensions or insurance companies or the big banks or, 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 or whoever. And I mean, so to me, I was sort of thinking this is, you know, look, I, I had to, I, I brought in somebody you probably know, um, who's also been a guest on Cleaning Up, uh, Guy Turner. Uh, yeah. And he came in and we created a carbon analytics business. And, um, uh, and we sold services, but it was always, I'll be honest, my heart was never in carbon markets and uh, uh, around them, to, to be honest. But, well, that, but makes we, the, that makes two of us uh, on this podcast. Right. But then uh, but let's, anyway, let's there's, there's the, a, there's a dynamic the in the negotiations where, you know, others set the agenda and the, you know, the developing countries generally, even large developing countries have to play along. You know, it's not framed uh, in in terms of you know what they wanted and even the largest developing countries had huge misgivings so if you go back and ever not not that you would listen to the actual submissions you know in the final plenary there is complete rejection of carbon markets by india by china by brazil it's it you know it's in there this language at the very last minute as a result of basically the US and a few countries like Australia and others, even the EU didn't really care about it. So, right, so I'm, but, all I'm saying is that right. you know, the but design you of these right. but, things is never, uh, okay. you know, straightforward. And but to I be, you know, there, you know, there was, you know, the other thing that was going on was, and this was coming out of all the activists and, and, and everybody, was this idea that there needed to be a hard cap, that there needed to be a kind of a carbon budget. And, you know, the premise of Copenhagen was, we're going to agree a cap and then we're going to have this big arm wrestle and a negotiation and divide between countries. That was the Kyoto Protocol was based on that. Copenhagen, And of course, the whole thing blew up. And I would argue it blew up because it was com you know, completely, um, you know, it, from a game theory perspective, it was a ridiculous goal. And then we went into this kind of five years leading up to Paris. And, yeah. and at that point, we started to at least get a framework which is comprehensive, and which is not based on just a bunch of developed countries, you know, hoovering money out to the rest of the world, which is what, you know, which was the model behind a lot of the, the negotiations and the conversations around the Kyoto Protocol and so on. And, and we, got the, we got the Paris Agreement, which I think of as, a, as an extraordinary um, triumph of, of diplomatic manoeuvring. Is that a, a fair fast forwards? Well, I, I think, I, look, Paris helps bring countries, you know, together who are unable to agree legally binding emission reductions, actually. So neither the US has ever signed up to them, nor nor would China. And then, you know, there was a massive sort of standoff. And in at least in Kyoto, there was acceptance that there was a, a legally binding emissions targets. You know, some of them were... Um, reduction targets and some of them were abs absolute reduction targets but there was a cap and that was agreed in 1997 so actually that's the high point of international environmental law is 97 this well, from a, legal from approach. A, from a and then everything goes right. everything goes down the drain well, after that no, that's from the, let me push back on that because that's if what your model is is a cap in law but if you realize that a cap in law is not going to be 
um, accepted, it's not going to be binding, that China wasn't covered by it, the US didn't accept it, that Canada resiled from it, that, you know, so it wasn't a high but, point, it was well, an I, I think that's where, I think that's where I, I will be writing a book which actually says what was going on at that time. At that time, the US nego negotiated in good faith its legally binding target it, it really did, you know, that's, I've got my Kyoto Protocol here, the, the numbers then, you know, add up to four, five point something or whatever it is. And there is leeway, like Russia has included a whole set in its, in its target that essentially, you know, would provide some coverage for the US, you know, they would do a trade actually. So the US, the, the stretch required so and and other countries as well so these were real targets that were negotiated and at that time they weren't a million miles off from the science at that time you know so we're talking 1997 the kyoto protocol and its legally binding target and its list of reductions assigned to every country which each country is accepted and put in themselves by the way no one's imposed it on them they came right. up with those figures so that is in 1997, and after that, it becomes problematic because the richer countries don't want to implement their, their, their reduction targets. And then this huge yeah. looming issue that was brought up of developing countries immediately having to sign up in equivalents, legal equivalents, and in absolute targets, you know, absolute reductions – you know, was seen as unfair. And the model that we were using was actually the Montreal Protocol, which even without giving 10 years grace, which Montreal Protocol did for ozone depleting gases, you know, there was a very clear, we go first, we each countries go first, you guys have 10 years and we'll help you do that. That was the model. So that all broke down. It wasn't just that the idea of the cap was ridiculous. It was actually, it was the fact that they there was no implementation by the richer countries because as we know they created then these carbon markets which then basically everybody could see there was just paper compliance and not real reductions number one secondly they did not give the grace period that the developing countries were expecting and were thinking that this is the model yeah. that we're using. So that's what happened is what, it, that's what, also what, happened, that Farana, Farana, what also happened was that China embarked on 15 years of the most extraordinary export driven coal fired development, environmental dumping, as far as the eye can see, which is still, they're still benefiting from in their enormous market share of a lot of markets like the rare earth markets and so on. And it became abundantly clear that any agreement, you, you put up a good argument to defend the Kyoto Protocol, but it was an absurdity because it frankly, um, you know, China in that period became the number one emitter and was not bound at all. And India looked set to become the, the next big you know, emissions growth story and Africa, as it becomes more industrialized, will go the same way. So that 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 framework was never going to work, was it? It was not. Well, we cannot. It, I think it wasn't never going to work. It was it never worked because the basic premise that richer countries start by phasing down or phasing out some of it, which they still haven't. We're still having that argument right now, right today, where the IEA is saying no new oil, gas, coal. And we have been building in Europe and in the US outwards. And those countries rightly said, you have to walk the walk, which is what this agreement is based on. It's not that it's based on a ridiculous model. It's based on the realities that actually no rich country, Germany, Poland, the UK carried on with their fossil fuel based economies. And at the same time, and as a result, again, of both privatization and globalization, you had basically an outsourcing of the most dirty industries um, to countries like China, India, Pakistan, parts of Africa. So you actually had a completely hypocritical situation where there was a promise of leadership. The wealthiest countries, which has caused most of the pollution to date, they still had, they were not picking up. Uh, responsibility of actually changing their economies. They had then said, we will buy the permits from you. You reduce over there, we'll buy the permits off you. 
And that's that's what led to Copenhagen and a complete breakdown. That's what led to a complete breakdown. It wasn't, I think, the legal approach as such. You know, it was the 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 duplicity and the complete mismatch between what the principles, the underlying principle, the grand bargain that was struck in 92 and 97, and then later on, and a complete lack of carrying it out, that was at, that you, was at the heart of it. But do you not find it ironic that you know, Copenhagen collapses, according to that narrative, because of the failure of essentially the G20 countries to act? And yet, act, that almost precisely marks the moment when G20 countries decoupled from CO2 emissions on an imports adjusted basis since around 2007-8 the G20 countries have actually been reducing their emissions um, from you know from almost exactly that point and now they're not reducing them fast enough and I'd be the you know I'm, I, you know you and I will, will there won't be there won't there'll be no difference between us in terms of you know we would both like this thing to go much much faster but the fact is, that the developed countries now are reducing their emissions and they're not doing it just by outsourcing manufacturing to the developing countries. And the absolute, you know, the thing that threatens the long term, you know, whether we can get to um, uh, one and a half degrees, two degrees and so on, is actually no longer the developed countries. It's no longer those countries. It's actually the, the large developing countries. Well, Sure, they have a much greater proportion, you know, India and China are right up there in a way that they weren't, even in aggregate terms, they weren't up there when we negotiated Kyoto, they just weren't, you know, they were not in the top five or the top 10, you know, they were well below that. So obviously, things have have changed uh, massively. And from the point of view of small island states who I've negotiated with and least developed countries, we were pressuring all emitters to take action but to to do so fairly and to pick up the fairness issue which you know brings me back to what has been one of the underlying you know bedrocks of my career fairness really matters you know at that time those developing countries thought it was an unfair ask for their emissions to be reduced and to take the same kind of legal legally binding reductions and to have a massive growth in emissions, a massive growth in fossil fuel based energy systems and the financing that was also going with that. So you have to understand and you come from the world of finance. You know, it's very, very recent. It's only in the last 10 years that we even had advocacy and campaigns to expose the role of the supportive role of finance and who's doing the financing. It is the largest centres of finance. London, where I'm sitting and you're sitting, it's still the largest, one of the largest centres of fossil fuel based finance. So you then get, you know, you know, initiatives like Carbon Tracker or the showing that, you know, the, the, the financial sector is holding up and supporting a level and a kind of development, essentially a fossil fuel based development in both rich and poorer countries in richer and developing countries. And actually that is, you know, completely out of kilter with what we're trying to do through our little environmental laws. You know, we we don't have the stick to, you know, discipline or even, you know, restructure the incentives that the finance industry works on. And that's why so much interest is going on now. And that's why, you know, groups like XR are targeting the financial industries, whether it's Lloyd's, whether it's Barclays, whether it's HSBC. Quite rightly, those institutions didn't take an interest, didn't care and carried on you know, um, in, incentivizing and supporting and financing the, the the very dirtiest things all over the world. You know, not just in in. Let's right. in, 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 I, I would. It, I'm just conscious of time because you know we've got. We, we just if we just follow up, just finish off on the negotiations. What happened then was fast forward to Paris, and actually one of our other contributors, Catherine McKenna, um, uh, who was the um, Canadian Environment Minister, talks about you know, you, your delegation from small island states and how she sort of, you know, supported it with the one and a half degrees and the and 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 and, uh, and so on. So we've, we've kind of elsewhere in cleaning up, we've documented that bit of what happened in Paris, but we kind of get the one and a half degrees uh, as a aspirational goal 
And then Christiana Figueres, one of our early episodes, talks about how that then translated into the body of knowledge, how important one and a half degrees is. And then the world changes through the arrival of Greta Thunberg and what you call XR, Extinction Rebellion. And of course, you played a big role there. Were you actually a founder of Extinction Rebellion? No, no, I was not a founder, but I joined at the end of, um, in the second half of 2018. So um, when they really hit the screens in the UK, for example, through actions to shut down London and the bridges, which were in hind, you know, looking back, a test for, you know, the rebellion that then happened in April of 2019, and which then spread to many other countries. And um, I was also, you know, a member of Greenpeace. I was a trustee of Greenpeace UK, for example. I was an advisor to WWF. I was stopped um, doing so much advisory work to the small islands. But the need for these sorts of more radical uh, um, campaigning groups arose um, because, frankly, uh, you know, net zero wasn't on the legislation. It wasn't. It wasn't legislation in the UK three years after Paris. You know, having negotiated uh, the phase out target net zero 1.5, Britain did nothing, you know, did nothing. Very few MPs even spoke for climate action. New, and it was la- the whole thing was languishing. So these different movements actually arose in different parts of the world because what was obvious was that there was a complete mismatch between what was happening on the ground, in reality, with emissions, and then with politicians right. sort of but, thinking, yeah, we ratified this right. thing. We don't have let's, to actually do anything. Right, but, yeah. but let's go. So just the reason I asked the question, because it just, you know, you were policy coordinator, political coordinator, and part of the rapid reaction, uh, rapid response unit. So yeah, there, whether that. you were a founder, you were very senior in this movement. And the, the movement, the goals of Extinction Rebellion was not to enshrine net zero in UK legislation, something that subsequently happened. And by the way, you know, all credit to, you know, all the various players, including, by the way, I'm not somebody who's against a bit of civil disobedience if it's it's appropriate, right? So there there was a process which ended up with that being enshrined in legislation. But the goals of Extinction Rebellion was... Um, communicate the danger we're in. Okay, I think that that's being done. Uh, um, you know, no doubt it could be done more. Every part of society must act now to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. And citizens' assembly and democratization, which I would consider to be trying to do an end run around the democracy that we already have. So this is an extremely radical set of demands far beyond what you've just very nicely described as you know an attempt to nudge the system to put net zero into legislation no i I, I didn't say that and i i think that the first and third of those demands the tell the truth demand has had a massive impact so again every institution newspaper you know from vogue magazine to the daily mail now carries climate uh you know related news you know around the year whereas before they'd you were lucky if they got a couple of features around the time of a major UN summit. That was that was it. Um, I think so. That demand was very important. We we know and statistically can show that you know environment and climate was really languishing and was nowhere on the political agenda. It really had taken a back seat with Brexit and with so many other things going on, especially. So that tell the truth demand remains very important, and it's also linked to acknowledging the. This, the 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 emergency that we're now finding ourselves in the climate and ecological emergency understanding that it can't just be every you know five years that we have a look at an election or something that we have to acknowledge how irreversible and huge the impacts already are in many parts of the developing world i'm sitting here and actually you know in the last week you've seen that temperatures in in pakistan and india in april have been over 50 degrees in some parts of the country countries which are still very much agrarian based economies large amounts of the workforce work outside and our people are frazzling frankly so these impacts are here they cooked into the system they're impacting millions of people right now so that tell the truth demand was very important so was the demand to have ordinary people being consulted and decide how they want these radical changes to happen. I think that's totally a wonderful demand. And again, it was actually taken forward in many 
uh, by many cities, by many council, my own council, Camden Council, had the very first climate assembly composed of citizens from Camden. Many other countries devise, you know, more participatory ways of discussing climate action and what does it mean, um, and not to have have these technocratic, you know, you know, energy economy models saying, oh yeah, just implement a carbon tax, you know. So so we'd frankly forgotten to consult and involve people and engage them. I think the, 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 that the net zero demand, you know, by 2025, that I, I always said, you know, let's set it as a 2030 demand, a 10 year. And there are loads of studies, actually, that, you know, Michael say that a 10 year kind of time horizon for a major societal change and shift, what became known as the Green New Deal idea, the industrial revolution, like a 10 year, you know, uh, Marshall Plan type idea, that makes absolute sense. And that's still what we must do. So it's less about the sort of dates, but much more about thinking you can't do this year to year, and you can't do this election cycle by election cycle, this is a societal overhaul. And I guess that's what brings me to where and why I joined. I felt like I'd been part of that incrementalist thinking, let's do it cop by cop. Let's do it every five years. Let's, you know, allocate a budget, try and sort of, and I think that that, that approach has failed. This is a whole of society, a totally reform the very underlying principles on which our economies are based and joined up um, so that they now incorporate nature and they incorporate people and they they don't do that currently so i feel like actually the entire financial system um our you know way in which energy not just energy but transport agriculture land is produced you know neglects nature it just just does and it neglects people in in other countries so we need a really big reset of what I call capitalism, actually, which is, again, a paradigm now that's used in many other parts of the world. We need that fundamental reset. It's more like getting rid of feudalism. You know, we're at that point. We're at sort of feudalism and feudalism and capitalism and move to something else, which is, um, I think, where we where we sit and where XR, I think, and many other movements are still trying to get us to. Do. And that's the right way to think about it. This isn't going to get solved by someone sticking on a carbon price, you know. Yeah. And and I guess that's 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 where you and I start to very much diverge. Having started with you know things need to accelerate, and you know I use the quote from uh, De Lampedusa, you know from Il Gatto Pardo, the leopard, which is um, uh, for things to remain the same, everything must change. And by things that need to remain the same, I would say that's kind of human progress. That's the lifestyles that, that people enjoy and aspire to. That's the ability to, um, to spend time with our families, to go on holiday, to have homes, to all of those sorts of things. But everything must change. And I see that as a vast call for innovation. And capitalism, misdirected though it may have been in the past, is this incredible machine for innovation, if it can be. And so I'm, I'm a sort of mission economy, mission innovation uh, believer, although the tools, I then very much uh, disagree with Mariana Mazzucato's essentially um, um, sort of nationalization of innovation. I think we've got to find much more sophisticated models. But, you know, you, you have basically said it, that this, you, you believe that the number one goal is actually the destruction of capitalism because otherwise none of this will happen. And I look at it going, well, that's been tried and it's failed well, to deliver no, no, right. no, I think that, to people. Yeah. And so, and we just don't have decades to go into great leap forwards, holodomors, collectivization of farms, all of those sorts of good things that have been tried the last times that well-meaning people set out on these kind of, um, you know, a destruction of system approaches to try to improve people's lives. It hasn't worked. It's caused enormous pain. We can't surely me, really be wanting to go there. But I'm not. I've never said let's bring back, you know, collectivization. I have never said let's go. No, let me finish because you said you've spoken for about three minutes about thinking of what I've said, and I haven't said any of those things. Capitalism does not take into account and the way in which other markets, even if they're in a socialist, you know, country like China, they're still basing the, 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 the fundamental political economy is orientated around not recognizing nature as an, an input that is different from technology and innovation and other things, number one. So the DNA of our political economy, whoever is doing it, you know, whether they call themselves Soviets, socialists, capitalists, whatever, 
The DNA of capitalism does not recognize nature in a way that is now very clear to us through our science, through our indigenous leaders, that we need nature to be respected and those ecological boundaries, whether you want them to, to, to have them as tipping points or a more spiritual balance, those need to be respected. We cannot substitute wealth with nature. We know that. That is what is happening. We cannot treat the atmosphere as if it's just a, a an input and that wealth will somehow buy us, you know, the means to to, 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 to breathe in clean air, or we can do the job that bees do, or that soils somehow are, you know, dispensable with. So, you know, soils, forests, air, the biodiversity around us is very different from the kinds of inputs that economists traditionally use and value in the system. So you come along with a bunch of economists who then say, well, we'll, we'll price those We'll price those, and then the but, but system will not, take care of them. That's, that's and that a, has not worked. Because so that, has, have, that has not worked. But that's no not, pricing that's not system a, that's has worked. Let me see. No but pricing that's a system has worked. You're, you're getting away with a caricature there. Yes, there's, also, there's, 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 there's pricing, no, there's regulation, you. there's all sorts of mechanisms that are being... But no, no system that we currently have does that it does not set boundaries on what cannot be you know extracted and used in that way and no system that we currently have anywhere in the world and this is why i've come you know 35 years later to the point that i have you know stop we have to stop people who are saying let's price this through carbon markets oh let's invent tradable systems oh let's invent e you know environmental governance EC, you know ESG let's let's do this and it's actually we've done that that we've been doing that for 30 years I have done it I've written my books are on carbon markets this is rubbish these how systems explain, are not working how do you explain fundamental, how, how do you explain yeah, we need a fundamental overhaul where the economy explain. is not nationalized but you know how we're you, sitting on a day Michael where we have Shell alone is announced you know, what is it, 7.3 billion, you know, pounds worth of profit in a quarter. And, how, do you explain, you know, the how do you explain that the wealthiest countries have peaked their emissions and are reducing them, irrespective of imports, and are seeing reforestation and improved biodiversity? The wealthiest countries, not the poorest ones, not the ones where the indigenous peoples have the most powers, but the wealthiest countries, when you say no country price this, nowhere in the world, try the UK planning system. If you want, if you think that it's unbridled capitalism, you know, running roughshod over every, every, it, it's just, that's just not the way the world actually works. So you've created this sort of straw man of the way and, you know, and then demonizing oil and gas companies. And, and, it, but, you know, I'm looking that we're at a point when, or, you know, when, when energy prices are peaking in part because we, we failed to invest in clean energy, but we also stopped those companies from investing sufficiently in no one, existing no energy. One stopped Shell or BP. They just carried on investing. Let's be very clear about that. And the moment of reckoning is coming for them. It's coming at the door. It's already here. They have continued to invest Number one, in huge greenwashing, lobbying, marketing, absolute corruption all over the world to push their toxic products and their toxic practices down the throats, increasingly of a more educated public who has rejected them. They have resisted regulation. They have diluted, watered down and torpedoed. The Kyoto Protocol led to, you know, weak instruments and torpedo the regulatory abilities to do that. This is these industries. That is why the rage is there, rightly so. And I'm at the head of that rage. I've seen that from the inside. These industries are irresponsible and they have still are now making record breaking profits. And our governments, you know, are in terror and, you know, in hock to them to the point where people are now impoverished in this country People are cooking one meal a day and people are paying hundreds of pounds over the odds. And we have got billions. And these are industries that are profitable only because 
the externalities and the impacts that they have caused all around the world, devastation, let's call it impacts, let's stop calling it nice, nice neutral words like climate impact, let's call it for what it is, you know, devastation, they, they don't have to pick up those costs. The taxpayers pick up the cost. The governments of other countries pick up the cost. The relatives of people in Pakistan and India who are facing 50 degrees temperatures pick up the cost through heat waves, exhaustion, lost employment, sitting at home in unbearable heat. Just this is the beginning of this year. This is what's really happening. And I think not accepting any culpability, any responsibility flies in the face of, first of all, history and flies in the face of what these companies are actually doing. No one prevented them from putting their money into renewables. You know, a few brave souls tried. Thank you, Lord Brown. You know, but by and large, that that failed, that stalled that effort to really push that. You had to have new entrepreneurs who came in and did that, who who brought the price of, um, you know, renewables down. You had to have governments who actually funded and, and brought the price of renewables down or battery storage down. These companies didn't do that. They had, you know, their balance sheets would allow them to to fund trillions, you know, into the right direction. And none of them did that. And the, as I said, you know, we're coming to the top of the hour. The moment of reckoning is here. They are resisting, you know, hell and high water, including through extreme corruption, including through, you know, frankly, wars to retain those those profits from a set of activities that are toxic for people, that are toxic for the planet. And there's no getting away from that. There's no getting away from them. No point just saying, oh, now China's doing more of them. I, I'm not protecting China. I'm, you know, we never have. We no one has. We've we've said let's do this fairly. Let's do this in a civilized way. Let's do it uh, 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 in a way where the the wealthiest and those who've caused it the problem and who've got the the the, the biggest means should play, pay a, a, a bigger a play a bigger share. But that hasn't happened. That has not happened, and that's what's led to a breakdown. Uh, and so I feel like danger? there's no, there's nothing left except like. But do you not see the danger that we, well, two dangers I think that are related. One is that um, society, you you put the culpability on these companies, and I'm not saying that they're free of culpability at all, right? Because we know what they've done, we I know exactly what behaviours they've indulged in. But the fact is that society has repeatedly continued to decide to use their products. And so is there not, number one, first question, is there not some culpability for society that they've continued and, and do, you know, to, to maintain demand, which these companies then have, it's very hard to see how they could not fulfill that demand. Well, I think- the second I think- thing, wait, wait, the second thing is, does it not bother you that probably only now a minority of the public supports the sort of actions that Extinction Rebellion promotes, that society as a whole is actually not supportive of the levels of disruption and direct action and so on, and actually is swinging much more behind, frankly, the oil and gas companies or the status quo, however you want to phrase it. Well, let's see in a week whether... (laughs) You know, the public are absolutely, um, I think, outraged. Uh, There's a mismatch between what the government is saying and what the public are saying in regards to this extortionate amount of profits being unfairly made and a windfall tax is being prevented by those who are directly benefiting, you know, and uh, are supporting those industries and have done for a long time. It's very misguided. Our political system, again, needs... Um, to be, you know, to, to to change. It's it's frankly prioritizing and not pursuing the public interest or the long term interest of the majority of people in this country, let alone of the world, let alone on, a, on a global scale. And that I think increasingly is the reason why these movements will continue. Not not all of the actions will be popular. That's not their point. It's to cause increased awareness of 
the huge footprint and the huge political power and the stranglehold, especially in even in the UK and in many parts of the world that these companies continue to play in our public life. And, you know, the, the best example and people are learning more and more about the the the, the shared and linked histories and tactics is the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry lied and paid and lost its way to uh, 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 very large profits. And ultimately, they lost because once it was found out that they had done that, there was a backlash <coughs> and regulators stepped in. And that's what's not happened here. Exactly the same playbook has been used. But right. the power of the industry I, I, is strong. And now the good news is, Michael, as a result of much of your work and many others, you know, we have alternatives. And we have alternatives that are cheaper in the forms of energy efficiency, almost free in the form of good, well-designed buildings. We have battery power. We have storage. We have, you know, markets that created those. They're not being taken up. At scale, Cap- at capitalist. You mean capitalist businesses that have created those? Yeah, not, but a large. Not, no, no, they have community groups in Camden that are producing the new solutions to <laughs> solar power or wind or large-scale batteries or the steel industry, yeah, the glass where, industry, the so cement the industry. Is, none of is, none of those community groups that you're talking about have had any contribution materially to the innovations that are, that are actually going to solve. Yeah, but it wasn't the market. market. It was Germany and the German states on the feed-in tariffs, and it was China, two state-owned countries with large, you know, visionary programs that use regulation, yeah. frankly. I win, you don't win on this one. They're the ones that have brought down the cost of renewables and innovated. It wasn't this, you know, little entrepreneur. We have got, you know, other... Th- so this proves Mariana Mazzucati's point that actually innovation isn't just from the private sector. The private sector feeds off large sale. Um, you okay. know, the private, so I had a session, we had Mariana Mazzucati on the show as well. So states yeah. have a role in, in um, the R&D and the creation of technology, but they're horrible at getting it to market. And that's the role of private sector risk takers, by the way, not necessarily little entrepreneurs. And the prices of renewables dropped, by the way, they really dropped when we moved to reverse auctions and got price signals into the system. Um, so the Germans, bless them, subsidized and oversubsidized and created technologies. That was marvelous, but it didn't really take off until we got price signals. But I want to come back to, I want to come back to, you had a falling out with the founders of Extinction Rebellion. And these, you know, and, and I suppose that speaks to my mind to this point about how do you remain popular? And by the way, just sorry, the one other thing, for the record, I'm okay with a windfall tax to the extent that it relates to extraordinary situation in, you know, to the, uh, in Ukraine and the impact of, you know, I don't think any companies should be making more money because of a Ukraine than, than any other, you know, than they would normally. But, but we don't have time to go down the windfall tax route. I'll, maybe I'll do a whole program on it. Um, but you've had a falling out because some of the people at the head of Extinction Rebellion were, I hate to say it, very unpleasant. And I think of Rupert Reed jumping on a table and telling children that they uh, that they shouldn't ask what they want to be when they grow up. They should ask what they want to do if they grow up, uh, asking 12-year-olds. Or Roger Hallam talking about, you know, sort of poo-pooing the Holocaust and uh, and and uh, describing scenes of, of rape and carnage as being the inevitable outcome if we don't do what he says. These are horrible people, are they not? And you had a falling out with them. Listen, I'm not responsible for what they say. I'm, you know, it's your responsible. Movement. It's your yeah, movement. I, yeah, I disagreed, you know, with many of the narratives that are used, many of the metaphors, many of the analogies, many of the tactics. In every movement, there's a huge diversity of, of, of people. And, you know, at certain points, I think Exile could have massively grown and reached a much bigger uh, share of people and taken them on that education journey, which I was very keen on and many others were. Um, so, yeah, they, these are important things. But I, I don't think any of those people are bad or terrible people. I think they also have 
you know, they may not be very politic in what they say. And as I said, I disagree with some of the things that they've said, uh, you know, ver very much. And not just tactically, just I don't agree with them, full stop. So that's that's fine. But it's a very diverse and big movement. But uh, they're also the people, people... The founders and the leaders. People, people, you can't say whether well, it was just every movement has you know, some bad apples. You know, when, when, I don't care that when push comes to shove, these are people... Gail Bradbrook is facing trial, facing imprisonment. Roger Hallam is facing trial, facing imprisonment. These people have, have laid down actually their liberty... Uh, and, you know, if they say something in politic or say something in the heat of the moment or they say things which uh, don't resonate with with certain demographics or are, frankly, you know, out yeah. of tune with what I call climate justice and with a way of speaking that tries to bring everybody on board, then that's a flaw that they have. Sure, most of us have different flaws, but I would never for one minute, you know, classify them as bad people or as terrible people. I feel that actually they've done a huge service to the global climate movement. They've done a huge service uh, to all of us and they've done a huge service to those people who are trying to make things better in their companies, in finance, everywhere else, because they've reminded people that we were walking, we were sleepwalking into, you know, the abyss. We still are. We're still all you know, on that trajectory, by the way. And that's maybe, the, as I said, with half the world, you know, a huge percentage of the world's population, I think one, one or two billion just in that arc sitting under a heat dome, which will last for a very long time, which has a massive climate related footprint attached to it. Um, our oceans are acidific, acidific, you know, subject to acidification. Our coral reefs are about to mainly die. There is nothing we can do about that. Um, we have major crop failures. We have billions of people who are going to face water shortages in the next five years from okay. now sure. onward. So that is actually where we sit and, you know, extolling right. companies who are making extortionate profits from selling te toxic pr products. I will never for one minute, you know, say a bad person here or there is is the problem that's that's the problem that we face is actually people who are yeah. totally irresponsible and i think they will face litigation and they will face the court of world opinion and they already are and they will face actual consequences for continuing to 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 do what they're doing which is you know uh, absolutely untenable sadly we are <laughs> much out of time i would love to continue um, and and we absolutely can perhaps uh, uh, when we next meet at uh, um, uh, it would, whether it's the the conduit club where I think we ran into each other initially or, yeah, or elsewhere. Yeah. But um, but I, it's very interesting because you know elsewhere on this series we've also talked to real experts on the scenarios, the trajectories. People like Glenn Peters um, in Oslo, um, uh, Jim Ski, Professor Jim Ski, who's the co-chair of the working group three of the IPCC. And it's fascinating because the scenario that um, you appear to think we're on is not the scenario that we're on. And it's very bad. We are on a bad scenario, but we're not on a scenario of imminent civilizational environmental extinction collapse. Um, and so there is a. Well, it depends on who you're looking at. Uh, as I said, my my focus, you know, has been on the most vulnerable, those who are already, right. you know, not in the not haves, you know, part, and that is the other backdrop to the last thirty years, the massive inequalities. So yes, we may be protected in the UK as a result of our temperate weather and as a result of our, you know, robust financial institutions and infrastructure which by the way has taken 300 years to acquire and is based on you know, uh, wealth and appropriation as a result of colonialism and imperialism. That's where we get our robustness from and you know, our civilization is based on that. It's based on a set of historical factors that have led us to be less vulnerable. And the system is currently producing billions of people who are very vulnerable. They didn't start off like that. No one starts off being vulnerable when they're, on the day they're born. It's the system into which they're born that makes their lives very different. That's where the trajectories are diverging. And that's why the UN Secretary General called the latest IPCC report, you know, an atlas of injustice. 
an atlas of injustice is what those reports are. And I don't think Jim Ski or Glenn Peters are disagreeing about that at all. No, and what's neither, remarkable is that neither, scientists neither, are neither, and neither, no, 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 and neither am I. In the, every answer of yours, there's sort of one bit I really agree with, and one bit that I completely disagree with. Because in terms of justice and in terms of the the disadvantage, I was a member of the high level group on on sustainable energy for all and worked extremely hard and continue to work on uh, energy access and solutions for those who frankly have got least. But equally, we are now in a really interesting point. Well, first of all, the scenarios are the scenarios. They don't talk about justice. They talk about energy systems, which are grossly misunderstood by most on the activism side of things. Um, uh, and, And the IPCC scenarios that are used that show these, you know, show the coal industry growing by a factor of 10 in order to justify um, these sorts of, you know, extreme positions. It's absurd. And and we've gone into that in quite a lot of detail in in episodes of Cleaning Up. But the other thing that's very fascinating, and I don't disagree, is that what we've got is a system that has got some deep injustices that date back to um, colonial times baked in quite clearly. But the question that you and I could no doubt grapple with for another hour is whether the climate negotiations are the right place to write or to get reparations for colonial wrongs, because that's where I think you and I would probably dis, you know, would probably diverge. I'm afraid we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Farhan and I were never going to agree on who was responsible for the lack of action to date on climate change, on whether capitalism can be reformed to deliver climate action at scale or whether it has to be destroyed and replaced with something else. But what we do agree on is the need for dramatic acceleration so that we can meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. My guest next week on Cleaning Up is Francesco La Camera. He's the Director General of IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. So please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Francesco La Camera. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation.